you know what that means, folks. That is the sound of fun beginning right here on the Paranormal Portal. The O's are back, and so am I. And I'm not alone here, folks. I brought my good friend, my co-pilot, my co-host, the big toe himself, Mr. Don Longbeard. I uh, yeah. <laughs> That was almost words. Well, Sugar Britches just said, big toes there. Oh, nice. <laughs> yes. I guess there was yeah. a little trepidation. You are People... Sol- Sergeant Holka. Sergeant Holka? Yeah, Stripes. Bill Murray. Oh, geez. Yeah, Sergeant it's Holka. It's been about a thousand years since I've seen that movie. That's where the big toe thing came from for me. Mm. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, the big toe. Um, but, yeah, welcome, everybody. It's Friday night. Thank you so much for spending at least a portion of your weekend with us because... That makes me feel really special if <laughs> you give up your own your own free time after a week of uh, grinding away in the mind. please don't stop doing that. Don't ever stop. Don't ever stop. In fact, let other people know about how you spend your time. As and, a matter of uh, fact, don't stop believing. Yeah, because yeah, we'll keep coming back. We're like a bad rash. <laughs> yeah. We will not go away. You can continue to tune in here on Wednesday, Fridays, and Saturdays, and Don and I will show up. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you use Desitin or not. They don't make an ointment for us yet. <laughs> so. Monkey butt cream. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. So, uh, yeah, we'll be back all the time, oh, and, and we're always thrilled to see you guys come back with us. And, uh, we, as we dive what the hell's this. wrong with you. We, well, yeah. <laughs> We're, we, we've given up on what's wrong with us. We're focused on you now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we can't fix us. That's it. Um, but we got a lot of stuff to get through tonight, as always. Uh, we are cooking through the evening, and if you've got something paranormal you want to share with us, then by all means call in. The numbers for fun right here on the Paranormal Portal are 720-923-0525. Zero zero. Again, seven two zero nine two three zero five zero zero. Yep, those are the numbers for fun. So we'll do our best to keep an eye on those, and uh, we, if you guys call in, but please hold the calls till after the after the news, because that's just how we get into our groove. That's how we do it. That's how we roll. That's how we roll. And uh, before we go any further, folks, I'd like to stay, just say a quick thank you to the sponsor of the Paranormal Portal, and that, of course, is Cryptid Coin. And if you're not familiar with Cryptid Coin, ladies and gentlemen, it's a brand new cryptocurrency who's got the heart of cryptozoology at its main mission. And by that, I mean that they are taking a, a significant portion of the coinage in trust to generate grants to award to research teams around the world in their cryptozoological research. So it's uh, kind of the first real leap forward in, in uh, um, you know, layman investigating because everyone doing it now is doing it on their own dime, on their own time and their own dime. So this is a great opportunity for those teams that are out there doing the work to get some bigger funding and uh, hopefully get them the gear and the resources they need to increase their efforts. So if you are interested in possibly uh, becoming a cryptid coin holder or you're looking at how to qualify for some of those research grants, head over to cryptidcoin.io. Again, cryptidcoin.io, and you'll get more information about all of this and so much more. And, you know, uh, there's more news in the, near f- in the near future coming up about uh, cryptid coin. So keep your ears peeled. Uh, but it's just really exciting. And a special thank you to Cryptid Coin for sponsoring the Paranormal Portal. So, Don... So, Brent, are you ready? Uh, sure. <laughs> just, just, just a yes is good. Uh, okay. <laughs> because it's time for the news. The news. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Paranormal Portal News Desk as we dive into tonight's issues of the news. <laughs> Well, we've always got issues, but these, yeah, are, these are news issues. Pretty much where I was going. <laughs> but we got some news stories pulled up that we hope will keep you wildly entertained for the first half hour of the show. And uh, this is the the news is coming tonight from unexplained mysteries.com. It's a fantastic site, wonderful source of a lot of amazing information. And 
cryptozoological UFO, as well as science and archaeology and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but they've got just a bunch of fantastic information. So check out unexplained-mysteries.com. Um, the first story is coming from unexplained-mysteries.com. And this one's kind of funny. It's, I, I don't know, it's not really a huge news story, but it's kind of interesting. And this is real-life bat interrupts screening of the Batman. Can I, can I point something out? Absolutely. So the, the, it's listed under the category of bizarre. Bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it was a real life Batman, then it would be bizarre. You know, I mean, but... like, you know, Aliens Landing is not under bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> it's under bizarre. That's true. But it's a real life bat interrupts screening of the Batman. And uh, I guess. That's kind of kind well, that's of. That's what uh, happens when you have a sparkly vampire playing Batman. <laughs> I guess he's doing a good job though. Uh, yeah. I've I've heard people that have seen the movie. Yeah. They said he did a good job. But yeah, well, they like <clears throat> Twilight too. <laughs> <laughs> Don's a little jaded. He's, <laughs> yeah. he's, he's a little still a little pissed about shiny vampires. Uh, a cinema screening of the Cape Crusader's latest outing was recently interrupted by a rather topical visitor. Topical. It says topical. Why wouldn't it say <laughs> tropical or? <laughs> I don't know where they're going with maybe, this. Maybe it's ointment. You rub it <laughs> off. Speaking like of ointments, <laughs> it's topical. Do not ingest. Uh, Ozzy. <laughs> <laughs> the unexpected interruption happened earlier this month at the, the movie house and uh, eatery by Sinopolis in Austin, Texas, where moviegoers found themselves attempting to watch the Batman while a large bat fluttered and swooped around and above their heads. Things got so out of hand that the cinema staff ended up having to put the movie on pause while an animal control expert <laughs> attempted to <laughs> unsuccessfully <laughs> to extri ext extricate the winged mammal from the premises. Uh, audience members were offered a refund. However, most decided to stick with it and watch the movie even with the on-screen superhero's real-life counterpart swooping around. It is believed that the bat was likely brought in by a member of the public oh, as a prank. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I guess that would do it. Cinema staff are now attempting to check people's bags to prevent the same thing happening again. Fortunately, there were no reports of anybody being bitten by the animal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's definitely not the way you I want. I am a bat, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. boy. I mean, that is... It is now, this... I, I've had tons of bats just appear in the house, you know, not only here but back in the in Minnesota. And I don't know. I mean, they're they're kind of creepy because they you know they do kind of swoop right by your head, yeah. but at the same time they're really good at avoiding things. <laughs> yeah, well. they don't crash a whole lot. <laughs> and uh, so I, I just you know I take a fishing net. I mean, it's just a fishing net because mm -hmm. they can't really see it, and it kind of kind of screws them up, and they can crawl out of it and fly again. But if you're quick. You can then hold them and in, in with a gloved hand and get them outside. But yeah, uh, I definitely am all advocating for releasing them because yes. they do eat yeah. a lot of crap we don't like. But like mosquitoes. Yeah, especially those mosquitoes. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know what, why the expert had such trouble getting a bat, but maybe it was just the size of the of the auditorium that they were looking in. But. Yeah. Anyway, that's the first of our weird stories for the night. But wait, there's more. <laughs> there's always more, folks. Woohoo! That's right, Don. Time for a good time. <laughs> Hold it down, that over was there, just, Mr. Anchor. That was just an hors d'oeuvre. Oh. Because <laughs> now we're getting into more of the weird. Yes, and... for Ozzy. <laughs> it's topical, Don. We hey, Ozzy, are you feeling hungry? <laughs> <laughs> we fancy a snack. Um, unexplained-mysteries.com brings us the next story, which is incredible video shows flock of birds crashing into the ground. Now, as, as opposed to bats. Have you seen this, Don? No, I haven't. But We're going to watch it because oh, it's so disturbing. It, yeah. um, I have seen it. Yeah. I don't know what the hell is going on, but these birds are obviously reacting to something really screwing with their equilibrium. Um, whatever it is, I don't pretend to know, but this just ain't natural. This just is not natural. But let's read the article first. A CCTV camera captured the bizarre moment a huge flock of birds flew straight into the pavement. Yep. Moving like a huge plume of black smoke, this enormous flock of hundreds of yellow-headed blackbirds was filmed hitting the ground in Alvaro Obregon uh, er, area of Qua Guatemoc, Mexico. Mexico. <laughs> it's in Mexico. <laughs> well, I at least got to try. <laughs> I can't, I got to educate this palate of mine, Don. <laughs> the incident when it took place last month resulted in many of the birds being killed on impact, while others managed to stop just in the nick of time before hitting the ground themselves. 
Now, according to a new study by researchers at Harvard University, the most likely explanation for this peculiar behavior is a case of follow the leader. I doubt that. I'm so tired of life. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> but Phil, you're in the lead. <laughs> Phil, uh, Phil's Phil. an octopus. Yeah, he's everything, Don. <laughs> he's got a lot of roles in the portal. Um, with the lead bird either being startled or mistaking something on the ground for a pool uh, for a pool of water, and the other birds all blindly following it down, I don't buy that either. No, I don't. The researchers blamed increasing urbanization and noted that incidents like this will continue to likely happen more often in the future as more natural land is replaced with streets and buildings. Or 5G. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. See, I'm thinking there's something that was really screwing with them. Um, they're not looking very. They're not looking very distant. They're actually following their closest neighbor in the flock. So basically, taking cues on where to move based on their closest neighbor says ornithologist Scott Edwards, who was involved in the study. Maybe they're the leader of the flock somewhere didn't know where to, where they were close to the ground. If that's the case, then most of the birds in the flock wouldn't know where they were close to the, that they were close to the ground too. Who the hell was the leader looking at? The guy in the back? <laughs> he hey, a, Joey! He was doing his makeup. Joey! Yeah, he was doing, was doing his makeup in a compact. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna put a link uh, of this in the chats uh, that you can certainly check out as well. I see Bams and TFR as his great guest. So good to see you guys. There's a link for you to check this out. And you probably, many of you have already probably seen it. Oh, no. But. Um, <laughs> look, look right there. <laughs> <laughs> wow, is that. that is, that's not funny. It's is not that, funny. Is it's that just, just weird, though? It, it is weird. Oh, my God. What are the uh, odds that that would be the ad? <laughs> All right, we're going to look at this, and uh, I'm, you know, throwing caution to the wind, as it were. But uh, here we go. Um, I'm going to turn off you the sound. No, we haven't. Yeah, there's the video right there, and you can see it, what's happening. But let's go here uh, and get right to the meat of it. But look oh, at that. Yeah. Boom, they are just yeah. diving into the ground. Right. So is that, I mean, is it possible it's just a prey evasion? Maybe there was a hawk moving in, and they just went, no, nah, get out of here. That many, that many would not be running from a hawk like that. Well, you wouldn't think, but. No, they just make a hole. In look at that, through. though. Look at that. Oh, That's my crazy. God. That is incredible. This is from Inside Edition is this uh, one hosting the, the video here. But just watch. Boom. That is, that's just bizarre. That's not what birds do. Uh, it is really fascinating to watch these birds as they flock as a group looking like a, you know, like a single mind. It's They're really incredible. They're flocking this way. But they flocked right into the ground. Toxic fumes. They flocked up, Don. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, they flocked down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they did. Um, very strange, whatever the case yeah. is. I don't, I, you know, I, I mean, if, if they're right, they're right. I just don't know. But, my God, that just thinned a whole bunch of the population right there. Yeah. Look at those little little dots all over. That's just tragic. I don't know what happened there, folks. But uh, if any updates come up about that, I guess we can dive into it then. I wonder if they're planning on looking into any of those corpses to see if there's any rupturing in their heads or something no, you know i'm sure they're not well they're probably not going to tell us if there was right that's true especially if they find out it's 5g <laughs> right you know, right so. yep it seems like they were hit by some type of disruptive wave or something pharmacy says yeah that's a good point um i don't know folks i really don't know hello <laughs> what? oh it's that the disruptive eliza. wave eliza oh eliza hello okay. hello to you as well um but yeah it is it's tragic it's really uh, of course, a horrible event. Yeah, they call it CERN. Yeah, you know, this is, where was it again? It was in, it was Mexico. in Mexico. Yeah, so I don't know if they got any CERNs down there, but well, who knows what they got cooking down there. Um, but it's anybody's guess. It's just a, just a horrible example of uh, nature gone wrong, uh, as it were. <laughs> but here's another one. This one has to do with UFOs. So um, take a ride at Albuquerque. <laughs> like Bugs Bunny. <laughs> All right, so the Pentagon's UFO files include an encounter with a werewolf, folks. What? I didn't know that either, but and that's coming. And this is under cryptozoology. This is. It's not, not even bizarre. bizarre. <laughs> it's, it could be under bizarre, too, though. Uh, it says, uh, this is, again, from unexplained-mysteries.com. Uh, a number of unexplained sightings and experiences have been revealed through interviews with former officials. 
For many years, the Pentagon, in connection with the Defense Intelligence Agency, ran, well, it's, they're supposed to be have intelligence, ran a secretive program investigating the connection between UFOs or UAPs and paranormal phenomena. During interviews with Military.com, retired DIA intelligence officer James Laketsky and retired CIA operations officer Jim Semivan, uh, who both worked on the secret the program. I was like, what's this? <laughs> that's not quite a full van. <laughs> it's a semi van. Uh, have lifted the lid on some of the strange cases that were investigated during that time. The, these investigations include that the USS Nimitz UAP sightings, as well as, as that of a Skinwalker Ranch, a property in Utah, notorious for being home to a plethora of strange phenomena. That sure means a whole lot. It does. <laughs> I see what you did there. That was good. I see what you did. According to Lekatsky and Semivan, uh, the three men who were... That's his, that is a weird name, Semivan. Uh, the three men who were sent to investigate the ranch were left terrified after they witnessed what was described as a black void on the property. Even more unnerving was the fact that they also reported experiencing paranormal phenomena after returning to their homes, such as strange noises and sightings of dark figures at night. In a separate incident, the family of, uh, UF, uh, the, family of the investigator who had been looking into the USS Nimitz case reported witnessing a wolf-like creature which walked on two hind legs, staring in through the windows of their home on two occasions. Ooh. Twice done. Twice? Twice there was a werewolf or a, a dog man looking in their window. Wow. When asked about them, however, the Pentagon was in, un, unable to confirm or deny. Boy, there's a, there's, uh, there's want, a shock. They didn't even want to deny it? <laughs> they, could, wow. they could not confirm nor deny that this happened, uh, that any of these investigations and encounters took place. Right. Um, yeah, that's, that's weird. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Is there, is there a correlation between UFOs and, and all these other phenomena? I mean, there may be. Well, it, there's, you can't say there isn't. No, you I can't. I mean, you'd be denied, you deny one, you got to deny them all. Right. So is it possible? Sure. sure. I, um, I don't <laughs> pretend to know, oh, but it is strange. It is strange. I don't know. But is it bizarre? It's very bizarre. It's so bizarre. So bizarre. So bizarre. <laughs> that's, that's one. Oh boy. Uh, you know, we, we talk about the murder hornets, those huge uh, Asian hornets that are seem to be everywhere. Well, <laughs> some people are making the best of a bad situation um, and uh, finding that maybe some of them just need some love. And this is a man uh, who decided to keep a giant hornet oh, as a pet. Oh, <laughs> the unnamed man from Japan allegedly ties string to the insect and takes it out for regular walks. <laughs> <Flights. laughs> yeah, sure, it's not walking, it's flying. <laughs> Measuring up to six centimeters in length, the giant Japanese hornet is one of the largest and deadliest insects in the world. It's... In its native Japan, these huge wasp-like creatures claim 40 lives on the average every year and were considered the second most dangerous species in the country next oh, to humans. <laughs> next wow. To humans. Wow. they has got to run in for the title. Uh, none of these facts, however, seems to have stopped one man in Japan from keeping one of them as a pet after he claimed to have caught it in a butterfly net and removed its sting and poison sacs. No. Wow, that's some determination. That's like micro surgery. It's, oh, it, it just equates to. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was just a quick impact, and it did the micro surgery. Yep, it's all gone. Yep, yeah, the bad part's gone. Let's go. He's after like this. <laughs> He's got it on yeah. his string going like this, like one of those. We're going for a walk. Like, like, a, like a bull roar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's the Where's Japanese coming from Japanese equivalent to the Australian bull roar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Oh, this guy's pretty determined to have a pet wasp. So, so I'm betting his his uh, delicate removal of those systems was more like a. <laughs> Um, but anyway, it says eyebrows are raised across the internet this week when a series of photographs posted to the man's Twitter account appeared to show him taking the venomous insect, uh, not anymore, for a walk on the streets of Tokyo using a small piece of string <laughs> tied to its abdomen. Oh, Jeez. Uh, he does bite occasionally, but it doesn't really hurt, he wrote. Uh, the story has since gone viral, and social media has been a buzz. Uh, <laughs> 
with efforts to determine whether or not the story is genuine. Some internet users have speculated that the images could have been faked as part of a prank, while others have suggested that it could be some sort of viral marketing exercise. So far, however, the authenticity of the story has managed to remain something of a mystery. Now, having worked... (laughs) <laughs> Having worked in corrections, I had <laughs> I had one kid who showed up into my class one day, and he had a bumblebee on a string. <laughs> He's walking down the hall, and there's something dangling in front of him, like moving. I'm like, what the hell is, oh, my God, get that the hell out of here. <laughs> he managed to tie, like, a long hair around this bumblebee and was using it like a <laughs> long hair. Oh, it was a long hair. This kid had really long hair and he took one of his long hairs and fashioned a little lasso around it and was walking with the damn bee. I was like, no, 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 no. True story. So I can believe that this might be legitimate because I've seen something similar. <laughs> he was, uh, he was, he was made to release his, yeah, captive so. in a hurry. <laughs> yes. it's, it's, it's so, napping. yeah, that's another five year sentence. <laughs> Some things are not meant to be. <laughs> Thank you. But it is a true story. I don't know. Oh, Very man. creepy. So it can happen is my point. I mean, it's not unheard of. Uh, although I, I would think a, a, a murder hornet's just not the, not the visual you want to give people when you're taking a walk on the street. Um, Jeez. All right, let's get to the next one as we're cruising through the, the show. we got four minutes left. I, I have a lot more news than I have time. Well, it's okay. Uh, we still have a But, we, have you know, Don, you ever, I'm a fan of Monty Python. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. I fought in your general direction. Well, here's a, here's a man that did just that. And uh, this, is, <laughs> this is coming from unexplained, <laughs> unexplained-mysteries.com. <laughs> Inventor <laughs> aims giant fart machine at France. <laughs> Mad Cat Boffin Colin Furs has unleashed the world's largest fart machine across the English Channel. <laughs> the eccentric inventor has become something of a celebrity online thanks to his bizarre inventions that range from hand-mounted flamethrowers to magnetic boots that can enable someone to walk on the ceiling. This time, however, he's taken things to the next level by building an enormous farting machine <laughs> based on a giant pulse valveless jet engine the same technology used in the infamous V-1 flying bombs that were deployed by the Germans during World War II. The peculiar contraption is not only capable of producing a deafening noise and a plume of fire when it's activated, but it's uh, even been set inside a huge pair of metal buttocks to (laughs) turn to to the largest machine ever built, farting machine ever built. Oh, dear God. Uh, as part of the well-publicized stunt, Furs took uh, last week took his bizarre invention to the cliffs of Dover, where, in front of an excited crowd, he fired the huge posterior in the general direction of France, which is a play on the Monty Python. According to reports, the noise was actually heard by at least two people across the channel. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so this is actually an old story. I pulled it out of the archives, but it's from July 30th, 2014. Apparently this happened, folks. Are you, but you're not going to play the video? No, no, I'm going to let that roll. Oh, I'm going to leave that alone. Um, but it's there. Uh, <laughs> if, if any, I guess I can copy the link. <laughs> I'll copy the link for all you uh, uh, <laughs> curious folk in our chats. Uh, if you're curious what a giant farting machine looks like, this is it. Um, here it goes. I'll put it in the metal buttocks and bumhole included. <laughs> I know it's like it's. I what, gotta see that. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, it's one of those I probably should check out, but I'm probably not gonna. Um, but anyway, it's there for your viewing pleasure if you choose to check it out on your own time. However, um, I'm not gonna. Let me just look. Is there anything in here that's quick enough to read? Oh, I guess Don's going to check it out right now. <laughs> I checked that a long time ago. Uh, yeah, well, that's true. Oh, yeah, this one is kind of good. I think we can squeeze this into time. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, uh, we, uh, if you're ever going to bring on soldiers for a oh, war, geez. this is uh, shows you the holes in the system, and this is from uh, unexplained-mysteries.com. U.S. military drafts 14,000 dead people in 2014. Uh, computer error led to thousands of conscription letters being mailed out to men born in the 1800s. Oh, wow. The error, which was related to the Y2K bug, saw thousands of conscription letters being sent out uh, from the U.S. Selective Service System to the families of men who had died several decades ago. 
The letters insisted that the men register with the U.S. military or face a hefty fine and imprisonment. Shocked relatives such as 73-year-old Chuck Huey, was, uh, whose grandfather had died in 1995 at the age of 100, couldn't believe their eyes when the letters arrived. Yeah, it said he was subject to heavy fines and imprisonment if he didn't sign up for the draft board, he said. We were just totally dumbfounded. The error was eventually traced to the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, where the clerk had failed to enter a century during <laughs> a transfer of more than 400,000 records, prompting the system to identify 27,218 men born in the 1800s who had deemed to be applicable for a conscription notice. Selective service regrets any inconvenience caused the families of these men and assures them that the error has been corrected and no action is required on their part. What the hell are they going to do? They're gonna put a. Per- they're gonna put him in prison. What? They're gonna fine him. What? Yeah. What are I they gonna know. do? Well, I don't know, but I know what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to break, folks. So we'll be right back in just a couple minutes. Don't go away. That includes the news.
right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back and back at it here in the Paranormal Portal with yeah, Ren Thomas and my co-host, Mr. Don Longbeard. The big toe. The big toe. Don't All right, welcome, you. everybody, back to the second part of the show, the second segment of the show. As we are back from the break, if you're new to the show, we are also on uh, TFRlive.com, iHeart, tune in and talk stream lives. And so we got to take breaks and part of... Part of me augmenting that break needed was to put together the videos that you see on YouTube as something for you to watch that isn't a commercial. Other than hearing <clears> us <throat> talk about how we have to go pee. Yeah, other than us talking that's, about our body, that's our what body happens functions. When you get old, you gotta go pee. I gotta pee. Hey, dang it. Um, <laughs> get out of the toilet, I gotta pee. <laughs> Come on. The clock is ticking. <laughs> You'll never take me alive, you <laughs> bastards. <laughs> I don't know what the hell that even means. But anyway, uh, we do appreciate you being here, being a part of the journey as we di- drive through the night here on the Paranormal Portal. What the hell is that open for? I don't even know. I don't know, I don't know what the hell's going on here, but I got some fun paranormal stuff for you to... to... Oh. Why are... That's kind of a good, uh, yeah, we'll start there, I guess. It's uh, okay. it's actually from Lauren Coleman. So I found this article from the Sun Journal, uh, and we'll start with some Biggie Foot stuff because we all love Bigfoot here on the portal. Everybody loves some Bigfoot. That big, hairy cryptid has captured everyone's imagination. And uh, are they out there? Are they not out there? I think there are. Uh, I think there's a lot of people looking for them and turning up some pretty Pretty fascinating and compelling evidence to that uh, uh, to that result. But here's an article that was written. Um, when was it? February twenty seventh. So oh, it's actually like pretty. It's, ago, yeah. The article is by Catherine Skelton from the Sun Journal, and this is from the SunJournal dot com. Uh, this year, I mean, it's a Brit- really very new article, and it, the title is "Why Aren't All the People Who Are Looking for Bigfoot <laughs> Finding Bigfoot?" and it's kind of like, well, if it was that easy, we wouldn't be looking because <laughs> everybody looking would have found them. You know, it's like, are there Bigfoot? Yes, there are. Okay, <laughs> what's for dinner? You know, I mean, what do you do? It's, it's a substantiated species. But in any case, uh, apparently Lauren Coleman's theory might surprise you. So let's check it out and see what that is. Um, it says, spoiler, ladies, get your camping gear ready. Ooh. Um, Where's Gigi when you need her? I don't know. She'd be like, oh, I need a new boyfriend. (laughs) Jesus. All right, let's check out the article and see what it says. Cable television is full of folks knocking about in the woods looking for Bigfoot. Animal Planet's finding Bigfoot even came to Maine to search. But there's not much finding for all of that looking. Ooh, that's kind of... That's a little bit uh, jaded, isn't it? Yeah, well, you know, you know, uh, that's, um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, again, if it was that easy to find them, we wouldn't be looking because we would have found them. <laughs> we asked Maine's own Lauren Coleman, a world-famous cryptozoologist working in the field, as of as yet undiscovered creatures for more than half a century, why he thinks that is. Part of the answer could be technology, he said, having the right camera at the right time. I, I mean, even having a camera that's ready at the right time, because again, <laughs> most Bigfoot sightings are just seconds, like <laughs> few, like two or three seconds. Well, that's like Bear was on the show one time, and he said, "Yeah, we even <laughs> took a camera crew out there, and they were rolling the cameras, and they they just weren't pointing in the right direction. Yeah. They missed it all." He said they had a Bigfoot run right in front of them on this <laughs> on this boat landing, and their cameras were all pointed the wrong <laughs> direction. The wrong way. I mean, you know, that's just the thing. It's it's like you can serve it up on a platter, and if, if people aren't in the right headspace, they're going to miss right. it because it's boom. They're just done. But anyway, uh, by the time you get out your cell phone and turn it on, the Bigfoot has already left, he said. And I think all the tree knocking, howling, finding nests, they're all, getting, they're all really just getting distracted. The way the Bigfoot will be discovered is in one small area of the Pacific Northwest when a group of women go out and just stay in the woods for six months. What? Uh, I guess that's his plan. You know, it, it's, there's merit to that. Yeah, so well, yeah. the thing is, is that we, we, we assume that Bigfoot could be like other primates and, and is very receptive to pheromones. Now, they, they, there's an argument that every living creature is susceptible to pheromones. Uh, and are attracted to certain ones and not. There's, you know, uh, perfume companies that stake their reputation on that fact as they use pheromones in human uh, perfumes in order to 
make you more attractive. Um, if that's true or not, I don't know. But the the problem could be that uh, a male big, Bigfoot is not really interested in finding a human male. But a, a human female could be a more attractive thing. Yeah. Um, if there is a reception to the pheromones on that same level, it's it's a great idea. Well, you know, I like human women a lot, too. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, there's that. <laughs> I, I would, you know, much rather... Uh, come across come across a, a a group of women camping than a, a group of smelly guys, but uh, I'm just saying it's human nature. But maybe impossible, Coleman said, given people's busy lives. But he has a theory. I have a feeling that there's something in the pheromones. I have not read this for the record, um, so that's cool. We're on the same. Lauren and I are on the same way wave, same wavelength here. In, in males that are driving Bigfoot from them, and most of the success that's occurring is with small groups of women that are they're having contact with no guns, maybe not even cameras, and really not getting all excited because. They don't find evidence right away, he said. Jane Goodall and every other primatologist that's had success has been female, and I think that's going to be the future. I didn't know Jane Goodall wasn't a woman. <gasps> she is. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. In the meantime, he predicts New Guinea and Sumatra may be locations of the next as of yet undiscovered to be found. And he must be talking about Orang Pendek. Um, I, but I think that the Orang Pendek is probably more closely related to um, to orangutans than than cryptids, but maybe not. Uh, I've been uh, predicting for quite a while, f uh, quite a few years now, that New Guinea will be the source of new animals being discovered, new species, and not too far away from there. Sumatra is, I think, the next place where a little hairy creature called the orang pendek will be discovered, uh, Coleman said. All of these people are looking for the Loch Ness Monster, looking for Bigfoot, and they'll keep doing it, but the real success will be in Southeast Asia in that area. And I think more and more will, more and more that will become the place to find new animals. That uh, could be right. Um, I think there's merit to what he's saying. Oh, look at that. There's the gremlin. That's awesome. Huh. Yeah. That's not great. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I think he's got a point at least in some respects. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. Let's say Bigfoot culture is a male dominated culture. Then, you know, they're going to steal away from steal, steer their family groups away from other males. Uh, I mean, it's just a biological competition of sorts, even if it's not, you know, on our agenda, they don't maybe know that. So um, maybe they would steer it away. And of course, you know, men are generally more aggressive than women and could bring more ca cause to harm for the family groups. So, maybe a group of females would be much more uh, of a of an interest for them. And and but also I, I also think that that's kind of dangerous, right? Because we don't know what what is their interest <laughs> exactly. There's the First Nation stories of uh, them uh, taking maidens and and never seeing them again, you know? Right, Don? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. And no, they have not found the Orang Pendek yet. No, I I didn't think they had, but Well, somebody well somebody asked. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. it was Ruger. Yeah, Ruger. Ruger. Oh, dear God. Maggie, what? Uh, her husband is up a ladder right now in thongs. <laughs> like flip-flops? Uh, yeah, we're hoping that's the shoe version of thongs, not the not the, well, not the undies. She, she is Australian. She is an Australian. <laughs> They'd still well. call them flip-flops down there. Oh, okay. Or they actually, they actually still call them thongs. We call them flip-flops. Okay, gotcha. Because of thongs. But I thought that was an interesting article, and I think Lauren is is probably very right. At least, at least I, I imagine that <laughs> that group of bumps. people that okay, <laughs> that group of people is uh, probably more more likely to have an encounter with uh, with a, a Bigfoot than a, a group of men. Hi, come here. He's a little vocal one, isn't he? He's a talker. <laughs> Hi. Show him in the camera. Hi. Yeah, they saw him last Oh, they, they did? Okay. Wednesday. Yeah, he's a little sweetheart. Hi. He's starting to get all a little more mellow. He's not quite as, quite as funky as he was when he first got here. I, I think he does have part Siamese in him, which means he's already a little wired a little higher than than most other cats. But Hi, He just cuddled right up. Yeah, he's a little, I mean, he's he loves a good cuddle. It's just really cool. He, like, came with the cuddle feature enabled. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he's, he's a great little guy. Um, 
that I thought was a good article. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And for whatever it's worth, I mean, everybody has their own opinions on these things, of course, but I think it's, I think he's right. I think there's truth to that. The next article, I, I'm, this is, this one's kind of cool because of course, Don and I have become friends with, uh, with Russ Accord, uh, uh, through our conferences and such. And, and, uh, talking with him several times but he's a wonderful wonderful that guy he's hilarious he is really great i have a piece of audio you'll never hear <laughs> it was awesome yeah exactly and, and so i'm really excited for them that they got um i, I guess they they got renewed for season three yeah they're already yeah i think they're i already think they're already on. shooting yeah. it uh, i don't know when this article was from but i saw it and i was oh yeah it's from february 28th so it's not that old expedition bigfoot season three travel channel Series returns in March, and again, it's a, it's another televised Bigfoot search, and and you got to take that for what it is. But I I really think uh, you know for all of the hits that B- Finding Bigfoot has taken, especially by people in the community of the Bigfoot community, they they really like to hammer on those guys. But I, I'm here to tell you, I don't believe we'd be having the conversations we are today without the advent of finding Bigfoot coming on the TV and, and demonstrating this phenomena to you know millions of people across the nation and around the world. I just don't think we would have the kind of dialogue and discussions that we do right now if they hadn't right. broke that discussion and broke that dialogue in uh, our you know televis- television. So uh, I think they do deserve a lot of accolades for that. Now, of course... Running around in the forest with a huge production team is never going to probably give you the results you want as far as actually finding a Bigfoot. But they did talk about behaviors a bunch. They talked about trackways. They talked about, you know, tree breaks. They've talked about so many things on finding Bigfoot. So it it really brought a lot of uh, information to the mainstream that otherwise we'd probably have a much smaller interest group in Bigfoot as of this day. So... I, I think that uh, Expedition Bigfoot is much the same way. I mean, they take they take a lot of criticism, but they're 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 out there doing it, and they're out there at least bringing it to all of us in a in a manner that is accessible to everybody. And I think that's awesome. So let's read the article. It's and this is by Regina Avalos uh, as of February twenty eighth, twenty twenty two. TV series finale dot com is the the site for this. It says. Expedition Bigfoot is returning for a third season next month. Travel Channel revealed that viewers will see an interview with world-renowned primatologist Jane Goodall and more in the upcoming season. Travel Channel revealed more about the return of this series in a press release. A year after devastating wildfires forced the the team to evacuate the Olympic Peninsula, just as they unearthed fascinating new evidence, acclaimed primatologist Dr. Maria Mayer and Bigfoot experts Bryce Johnson, Ronnie LeBlanc, and Russell Accord return. <laughs> what? Bigfoot experts. Yeah, well, I mean, as, as, far, as best as yeah. possible. Yeah, they use that term, experts. It's like, <laughs> we, there aren't any, but. We love but, you, Russ. Yeah, we love you, Russ. <laughs> um, return to Washington State in Season 3 of Expedition Bigfoot, premiering Sunday, March 20th on Travel Channel and streaming on Discovery+. Plus. The new season kicks off with a special new evidence pre-show at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, Pacific Time, looking back on their journey and including a surprising conversation with renowned primatologist Dr. Jane Goodall and Dr. Mayer and then launches into the season premiere at 10 p.m. Eastern Pacific Time. The season spans 16 one-hour episodes, including a pre- and post-season specials that recap all of the evidence collected. Knowing of her interest in cryptid animals, especially hominids, Dr. Maria Mayer, Expedition Bigfoot resident specialist or scientist, contacted her longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Jane Goodall, to discuss her beliefs and personal investigations. During the unprecedented on-camera interview, Goodall revealed that she has been told many unexplained stories of human-like primates from native people living in the jungles of South America and does not discount them. Just about every country had Bigfoot sightings, said Goodall, and I met people that have said they have seen something like Bigfoot or Sasquatch. In fact, Dr. Goodall believes these could be highly intelligent creatures, which would explain why no remains have been found to date and embraces the, the team confirming the search. I approached this expedition with a healthy level of skepticism and an open mind, examining all our evidence through the lens of science, said Mayer, but 
Science cannot explore closed doors. And like Jane, I believe that it's not about proving or disproving. It's about maintaining the curiosity and wonder of exploration that's necessary to make new discoveries. Having a giant in primatology, like Jane, uh, says she believes they could exist and expresses support for our research, only re-emphasizes the importance of this and invigorates our investigation, said Mayer. Encouraged by a notable discovery from the previous expedition, the team devises a new plan to rouse a Bigfoot from hiding and prove these elusive creatures are not a myth but a reality. In the season premiere, Strange, uh, Strange Returns, the team returns to the Olympic Peninsula with a new plan to draw out Bigfoot by releasing primate pheromones via ah. specially modified drone. But after LeBlanc and Mayer see something watching them from above and a court is blindsided by a, a nighttime visitor, it becomes clear the hunters are now the hunted. Oh, Ooh. We're going to have to talk to Russ. Yeah, we're going to have to talk to Russ and, and, and see just what the hell's going on here. But it sounds fascinating. And uh, again, it's made for TV, so you have to understand there's there's there can be some editorialization going on there. But... Generally speaking, I heard we, Don and I had the pleasure of sitting and listening to Russ do his talk, and and he he's a fascinating speaker, and he brings some great points to the table, and and uh, a lot of information about you know how to look for them, what are you looking for, and and I, I just really enjoyed it. He's so he's not just a TV face; he's actually a, an well, he's also an author of sure. a few books, yeah, dealing with the Bigfoot phenomena as well, right. So, um, and we're going to see him in September. We are going to see him in September at Phenomicon, yeah. Phenomicon. Phenomicon in Utah. So, if any of you are uh, able to come to Phenomicon in Utah, Don and I will be there. And I think that's the most important draw for yeah, all of us here. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know if anybody famous is going to be there now. I don't know. They said, oh, the Paranormal Portal guys are coming. Paranormal coming. Jeez, let's just wait till the next one. Make way for the beard. <laughs> Absolutely. The big toe is going to hang out, so <laughs> yeah, that's you right. never know. But anyway, that's a... That's What's a, that smell? It's the big toe. Dawn's here. The big toe is here. Hey, that's, you got that's some smell. jam? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, that was cringe. I yeah, actually, was I actually cringe. Fis physically cringed when you said that. Ah, nice. <laughs> yeah, you elicited a physical response <laughs> out of me. That's not easy to do. So um, we're at about the eight-minute eight minute mark, so I guess we can read one of these. Okay. Let's read one of these, not this one, though. Um, here we go. One of these. Let's see. This one's not too altogether huge. No. Oh. Uh, oh. Oh. This is a, a report from Sasquatch Chronicles. Again, ladies and gentlemen, I, I know many of you are listeners of Sasquatch Chronicles, but check out the blog over at SasquatchChronicles.com because there's lots of reports and things that are placed on there, whether they're other shows that Wes highlights on the blog or there are uh, other emails and articles from, from listeners. There's lots of information over there, and, and uh, you can waste hours and hours and hours going through it and never you know come close to reading everything, but... There's a ton of information over there. And, and he also covers other topics other than just Sasquatch Bigfoot. So this one is from February 27th, and it has to do with a Wendigo in Vermont. And uh, it says, A Wendigo is said to be a mythological creature of sorts whose form, motivation, motiv motives, and behaviors differ throughout a variety of cultures and folklore. Yeah, that's the hard part about Wend Wendigo. It's, it's kind of this general term that can mean a spirit. Yeah. Like a possessing spirit, it can mean a creature, cryptid. It can mean uh, a ghostly being. It's it's any number of things. So it really does matter where you know where the the information is coming from. But uh, the Wendigo is depicted as a malevolent spirit as well as an enchanting beast, and is normally based on legends from the forests of Canada or the Great Lakes region. The creature normally possesses some form of human characteristics with the ability to possess humans and turn their, them feral, feral rather, with an overwhelming hunger for raw meat. Ooh, just like mom used to make. <laughs> pate. My mom never made raw meat. She was a good cook. Mom's an awesome cook. <laughs> That's why I look this good. That's all I'm saying. In other pockets of pop culture, oh my God, I got to take a drink. <laughs> Did you say pockets of pop culture? Yeah, and I almost choked. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it sounds like when I nearly choke. Um, in other pockets of pop culture, the Wendigo has also been represented to look similar to a werewolf, yeah. but 
Most Wendigo possess horns or antlers, and that's actually a great image used to depict it uh, here. Because uh, it is supposed to be a very large creature, but also not full and robust like a Bigfoot. Like Bigfoots are you know, often depicted as these Hulk-like beings, but Wendigo is much more lanky and skinny. and, right. and uh, Stick uh, Indian. Yeah, kind of, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it says, a listener writes, I was riding back to campus on Route 9 from Applebee's in Keene, <laughs> New Hampshire, with my friends at about 12.15 in the morning. We had kind of gotten lost because it was hard to tell where we were in the dark. We're looking for a left turn and thought we had found it. We drove down the road for two minutes when our headlights lit up this thing. It was pale. It had digitigrade legs. The legs were not muscular at all, and they looked like bones that had been shrunk wrapped in skin. I don't remember what the feet looked like. Moving up, its belly was distended, like someone who was extremely malnourished. Its rib cage was visible. The head looked like a deer skull covered in skin. Mm. It did have antlers, but they looked like a spike bucks. What I mean by spike buck is a very young buck whose antlers have just started forming. It didn't look like it had eyes, but I could tell that it was looking at us. The entire encounter probably lasted less than five seconds before we sped off <laughs> in reverse. They put it in reverse, Don. Hey, Scooby-Doo does it. Why not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can't blame them, though. I mean, do you, do you continue to drive forward towards something like that? No. Or do you just nope out of there backwards? Yeah, well, you know. I think I would do, do the backwards thing. Well, I know what happens when I hit, like, big... Big animals like elk and stuff. <laughs> you hit an elk? Well, people hit elks all the time. No, I mean, did you though? No, I've oh, never, okay, good. I've never this the biggest thing I've ever done a hit was a <laughs> was like this little like bulldog that ran out in the middle of oh, the highway. Oh, oh man, it sucked. Yeah, that's horrible. Oh well. I you know it's just funny the way you said it. The biggest thing I've done is like you're you're going for the top score. Did, did I? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> my death race two thousand two thousand yeah. points. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if I saw one of these things, I'd definitely go the other way mm -hmm. because you just don't know what you're dealing with. And you don't, I mean, are they, are they extraordinarily like supernaturally strong as well? Well, I would think so. Yeah. If they're walking around just with digitigrade legs and shrink wrap skin over a skeleton, then something's not right. You're dealing with something all wrong. But <laughs> yeah, there's not a good thing. To there's, yeah, there's no goodness coming out of that situation. So getting away from it, I, I can I can understand and respect that quite a bit. It'd probably be the first thing I'd do too. Yeah, I'd just get the hell gone. Yeah, because I wouldn't want it to be the last thing I do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's funny in the picture here. It's like this this elven looking yeah, character like, with a little knife. About it. <laughs> yeah, you better get a bigger stick if he you're going to go at that deal. He better use at least an axe. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like. Wood. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, I, I think they're they're absolutely horrifying, whatever they are. Now, I you know, again, I don't pretend to know what they are, but are they physical? Well, sometimes. Sometimes they're physical. Let's get physical. Physical. <laughs> oh, Jesus. You are Yeah, just... we ought to play a game. We ought to play a game called we Guess are... What Songs Going Through Don's Head. Oh at dear this God. Moment. Yeah, you'd need a huge <laughs> amount of time to go through that. We uh, right. speaking of games, we are gonna do games though, um, when we hit ten thousand subscribers, which we're about ninety away from right now. So our our game show celebration show is gonna be coming up soon, hopefully, as we close this last ninety subscribers on our YouTube channel. Then we're gonna have a, have a bit of a party, of course. We're going to get together with all of you, have some fun and games, do some contests, do some quizzes, and uh, make, a, make a laugh, make a few laughs while we're at it. You know Don? Yes, I know Don. He's a good guy. I mean, it's been a long haul to get to 10,000. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been five years. <laughs> it's been five, <laughs> five full years, and, and, and it's been so weird because sometimes we just like sprint up a thousand or a thousand and a half and then and then it's like we're almost moonwalking it's back like, to a thousand it's it's like dawn running uphill oh yeah there's dawn not, doesn't run up no. a hill at all yeah exactly dawn gets in the golf cart and push <laughs> pushes with <laughs> fred flintstones it yeah i know well that's been that's what our that's what our climb and subscribers yeah. has been like and so we're really excited to finally hit that 10,000 mark and it's coming it's coming folks we're going to we're going to get a brass button <laughs> we're gonna get a brass button <laughs> they'll send us a plastic button 
you go. We get a plastic thing to hang on the wall. Yeah, you did yeah. it. Or, or a pin for our it's, lapel. Yeah, and it says it says thanks for participating. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a participation trophy. You don't actually place, but you get the, the participation award. That's about our career on YouTube so far, but um, we're hoping to change that. Once we hit ten thousand, I think it'll it'll start marching forward a little quicker. But it's just been, I hope so anyway. I've hoped that for every thousand we've hit, it's like maybe this is the one. But, uh, you know, again, we would do this show if there was only five of you guys here. But we would love for it to be a lot more. So we're going to go to the break, folks. Don't go away. More of the Paranormal Portal coming up in just a couple minutes. We'll be right back. Caroline is not like those. She's 
is with. They're attracted to the one thing about her that is different from themselves. Her life force is very strong. It gives off its own illumination. It is a light that implies life and memory of love and home and earthly pleasures. Something they desperately desire but can't have anymore. Right now, she's the closest thing to that. Poltergeist are usually associated with an individual. Hauntings seem to be connected with an area. A house, usually. Your guys' disturbances are of fairly short duration, perhaps a couple of months. Hauntings can go on for years. All right, folks, welcome back. We are into the second hour of tonight's show, which means we got two segments left, this one and the next. And so we are going to do our best to entertain the hell out of you in the, in the remaining time. If we've done our job, you're going to feel entertained. <laughs> if we haven't, there might be something wrong with you. Because <laughs> we know there's nothing wrong with us. Absolutely not. This is no longer about us, as we were saying earlier, Don. Yep, it's not. We're, we're not introspective. Um, but we have more fun-filled articles of, of paranormal goodness waiting here for you. Uh, more from Sasquatch Chronicles, as a matter of fact. Um, and let's start there, huh, Don? Sure. Should we start there? Let's start this. Let's, let's get, start there. Let's get this party started. <laughs> you sounded like a DJ just then. <laughs> All right. Okay. I don't know. All right. <laughs> Let's get to the next one. This is from SasquatchChronicles.com as well from the blog. And this is an article from the 25th of uh, February. So, again, pretty recent stuff. But, again, special thanks to Wes letting us peruse this to bring on the show here. And this is Strange Lights near Daytona. So, again, this is another example of, of you know, it's not always just Sasquatch stuff up there. He's got all of the paranormal stuff really represented on this blog. There's a lot of great, great information. Um, It's all about Ricky Bobby. (laughs) Oh, dear. Uh, I named my internal, my internal network at home, Ricky Bobby. Did you really? I did. Oh, funny. (laughs) My Roku's name is Chuck. (laughs) All right. Uh, I don't know what Chuck means. Is that part of it? It's just funny. Oh, Chuck. Okay. (laughs) Who's Chuck? Where did Chuck go? I can't connect. Uh, A listener writes, I'm a truck driver based out of Florida, and I listen to a lot of podcasts. And a few months ago, a bartender turned me onto the the podcast. I've been listening to it pretty much nonstop ever since. I'm reaching out to you to tell you about a strange light I saw the other night. That's kind of the way it works, too. Like, uh, I don't remember exactly when I found Sasquatch Chronicles, but I just remember finding it and going, oh, wow. And and just binge listening for months. I, I, didn't, I didn't find it until after I met you. Yeah, you know, I've, I've kind of corrupted you a whole bunch since yeah, you've known you know, me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but uh, there's just such great great episodes on this channel. And, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm partial to our own channel. Don't get me wrong, but I... I, I think this is really cool that uh, he's got this repository of amazing discussions with these people that have had uh, some incredible encounters. And it says, I was driving north on I-95, and I was just near, or just north of Daytona, and it was about 1 in the morning. There were nothing but pine trees on both sides of the road, and all of a sudden I see this green light appear about 80 to 100 feet in the air, about 200 yards in front of me. It was about the size of a baseball, maybe a little bigger, and it didn't glow, but it was lit up. It was in the air for a second, and then it shot down into the trees. It didn't drop. It went down with some speed. I tried to explain it away, but I can't figure out what it was. It just (laughs) appeared. I didn't see it go up or come down to the point it initially appeared. It was just there and then shot down. It's the only weird thing I've ever seen, so I'm trying to come up with an explanation. 
is not a big story, but I thought you might be able to add it to your other strange light stories that you have. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Don't say that too loud. Wes just appeared <laughs> in the chat. I <laughs> felt a disturbance. That's exactly what he says. Yep. <laughs> Whatever. I, I don't know what you're talking about, Wes. Never heard of her. <laughs> I said Smash Quatch Chronicles. Sub Sam Squatch. Sam Squatch. I, I wasn't talking about Sasquatch Squatch Chronicles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're uh, we're totally uh, perusing your your uh, your forum, brother, and uh, got a great story here. Now, I I I think these light anomalies are weird. Uh, and not in a bad way. It's just it's another one of those phenomena that it, it just has no definitives. It's like, is it a spirit? Is it a UFO? Is it some other kind of thing, like maybe an elemental of some kind or a nature spirit or whatever? I don't know what to make of these. Again, I've seen the little ones about the size of a quarter or 50 cent piece, but this one is about the size of a baseball or softball. That's uh, significantly bigger. And then... There's the people that see them like the size of basketballs and then bigger. Yeah, that's what <sighs> mine look like. That's what? Never mind. No, you got to tell me. What the hell was that? <laughs> mine are big as basketballs, too. Are we talking? Oh, we're not. We're not, <laughs> we're not. <laughs> Jesus God. <laughs> How big were the ones that you said were floating in your house? Were they, they were quarter size? They were 50 cent piece quarter size. Cent. Yeah, right there around there. Go. 50 cent. <laughs> Jesus you can suck the serious out of any moment, can't you? Just like a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> um, but I, I just think it's very interesting that this is one of those phenomena that's hard to nail down. Is it related to uh, a Bigfoot? Or is there something? God, cat here. Yeah, me too. Um, is it related to a Bigfoot? Is, it, is this some some parts? I don't know. I, I feel weird saying it's some part of their of their ability or nature because that just seems so hard to put my head around. But is it some some phenomena based upon the area, like ley lines? Is it just an energetic phenomena due to the energy flows of the earth? Or is it a ghostly thing? Is it disembodied spirits or, or some kind of spiritual presence that's manifesting as a light? I, I don't know. This is a tough one, and I, I really don't know what to make of these. Because it's it's attached to so many different phenomena. There are orbs reported during UFO sightings, mm -hmm. and sometimes yep. UFO sighting is the orb. But oftentimes people see these ships that break off these little lights that go out and about, and and then return. Sometimes they form the the main ship again, um, and then sometimes they're just these nebulous lights going through the woods, weaving in and out of the trees. Other times they're these much larger balls of light in mountainous areas, and it's just really hard to to get a bead on what the hell's going on here. True, true. And I, I know many people have had, you know, experiences with these orbs. I don't know what they are, but it is very curious. I don't know what the ones I saw. And, and could they have been somehow UFO phenomena rather than spiritual phenomena, which I assume they were? Maybe. I don't know. I have no answers, but I, I find the, the subject absolutely fascinating. So let's go to the next one. And this is uh, another one from Sasquatch Chronicles blog. And, oh, this is actually a video. I can't really work with this right now. Because we're on the network. Show me what you're working with. <laughs> Biologist encounters an unknown creature. Oh. Yeah, it, it looks like it'd be a phenomenal Gosh. video, but unfortunately we can't. We can't air that here. Um, here's another one from the blog. It's another video. Man, I did a nice job pulling, uh, curating articles, didn't I? Um, but there's so much information here on the Sasquatch Chronicles, Chronicles blog. It's so much more than just a podcast. So definitely check it out, folks. And uh, you can, I mean, you can literally go through these pages for weeks and never hit the bottom. There's so much posted on here. So exactly. Check, check it out. Support the man. Check it out. Check it out. <laughs> Support the Dark Lord. The Dark Lord. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I, I guess that's going to wrap up what I can cover here because I did a real uh, second-rate job pulling these up. <laughs> but I do have more, so much more that we can go through here. Um, the next one up is going to be an article that I pulled up from Money Made, and these are people reveal the, the ex Ooh. mysterious experiences that still haunt them. Yeah, mine's now, called ex-girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> still experience those i got some of that in my past too brother yeah. there's there's a few lines on my head that uh, were formed by those 
gotcha. <laughs> a few, gotcha. few creases in my skin that there, were. There was one that I always said that, uh, you know, thank God I, I didn't marry her because I would have ended up in prison instead of working for the prison. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, well. I didn't kill her. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> Where we killed each other. One there you go. Let's just move along. <laughs> All right, oh, so... um. But these are these are more like aggregated articles. We've covered several of them. Aggravated in the, articles. Aggregated. Oh, great, great, aggregated. Yeah, from Reddit. They 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 basically post uh, questions out on Reddit, and people submit their their stories and ideas and things that had happened. Allegedly, we can't verify any of these, but they are interesting. Again, this is money made moneymade dot com, and it's mysterious experiences. Um, this one is number one is scarier than the movie. One evening back in the 1980s, my mom was getting ready to watch a scary movie while my dad was away on a training trip. Uh, It was one of the first nights she had ever spent on her own in her entire life. As she moved straight from her father's house, excuse me, to a sorority house, and then straight to her husband's house, so she made sure to lock up and check every window, door, nook, cranny in the house before she put the movie on. Well, wait a minute. She lived in a sorority house and never watched a scary movie? No, just not alone. So this oh, is her, alone. her first experience absolutely gotcha. alone without surrounded by other people. Don't watch Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> there was not a single way in or out of that house that hadn't been closed up, yet halfway through the movie, she heard a noise. It was coming from the kitchen, so she gingerly dipped, tiptoed around the corner and found something shocking. There was a black and white cat sitting in the middle of the room staring at her. They didn't have any pets. Mm. Wow, that's so creepy. Like, this cat just appears. Do you keep it, Don? <laughs> or do you, I mean, where, where are you at with this? So you, Let's say this is you. Um, yeah, and then suddenly there's a cat sitting there. Uh, about uh, 375, 400, uh, an hour and a half with lots of barbecue sauce. Oh, <laughs> and rub it down with a good rub. There you go. Well, that's like, what happened. They like the those scratchy lovins. Yeah, um, yeah. She decided to keep her. My mom named her Devil Kitty, oh, and she was the first cat I ever had. Yeah, that's a kind of weird one, though. It's like, where the hell did that come from? Yeah, and why would you keep it? How, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, oh, hello. And then you named it Devil Kitty. <laughs> hello, Satan. <laughs> come here, Kitty. <laughs> That's just one of those that I, I think I would be I would be really apprehensive. It's either a gift of the gods or it's something evil. I mean, those are the two the two angles you got on that one. Um, number two, Big Brother isn't watching you. Some of these are are actually repeats, and I, I read through several of them before the you know, earlier today when I found this, and I was like, well, I, and so I apologize if there's redundancies. Again, these lists are are just you know aggregated. They're just grabbed and. Uh, a lot of times there's repeats, but Big Brother isn't watching you. When I was an early teenager, I got involved with the Big Brother's program. My Big Brother was a guy named Chris, who, like me, was a little odd, so we got along really great and hung out a lot. When we had been paired for about a year, he told me that he was going on a trip to Baltimore. He also told me the date that he would be back on. Well, I waited for a few days after his return date before trying to call him. But when I did, the person on the other line said, there's no Chris here. I looked in the phone book to make sure I dialed correctly, and I know for a fact that I did because I had the number circled and it matched the number I had dialed. But the man repeated, we've been living here for a long time, and there's never been a Chris here. Chris never returned from Baltimore, and neither I nor the Big Brothers program ever heard from him again. Wow. He just disappeared, Don. Yeah. Yikes. Hey, um, check your phone board over there. Oh, we got a call. We got a call. Let's get to the call. All right, let's see what's going on here. This is area code 410. You're on the air. Hey, guys. It's Android. How you doing? Hey, good, brother. How you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Since Wes was on, I thought uh, this might be a, a good time to call in and, and share this. Um, it's not my experience. Um, it's an acquaintance Um uh, that me and my girlfriend know who kind of shared this with us spontaneously. Okay. Um, we were watching finding Bigfoot one night and she was like taking a video goofing off and in the background, they were doing, you know, one of those show, uh, calls on the show, you know? Yeah. And, um, 
she wasn't expecting to do that. And so it went off in the background of the video where she was goofing off and she like, you know, cracked up laughing because she got that in the video and uh, herself doing something um, that she was about to send to an acquaintance, a friend. Uh-huh. And um, she sent it to him anyways. Or, and uh, he and he was like, what the heck was that in the background? And, and she was like, oh, well, we're watching uh, Finding Bigfoot. And he was like, oh, he was like, do you believe in that? And he, and she was like, well, she's like, I'm not, I'm not sure, but, um, I'm on the fence. She's like, I think it's possible. Mm-hmm. And then he was like, Oh, because actually, uh, um, I think I've seen one actually. And she was like, what are you, are you, you know, joking? And she was, he was like, no. And, um, this, this was like a couple months ago he had told her mm-hmm. and, um, and then and she was like, what, 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 where did you see one? And she was like, he was like, well, it was when I was in college. So it was like, you know, several years ago. I think he's like in his mid thirties now. So it was okay. like 15 years ago, probably. Uh-huh. Uh, give or take. And, uh, he, they were on, uh, the beach in California and it was dark. It was nighttime and they were having a bonfire, him and I guess a bunch of other college friends or something. And, uh, they heard this like, um, clicking noise like snapping or clicking i don't know exactly you know what it sounded like but i think he, he said it was clicking okay uh and um they were like you know what's that noise what's that noise and they started looking around with like a clicking or a chattering or something i forget what word he used to describe it this was my girlfriend explained to me what she he had told her mm-hmm. uh so it's kind of a third person story and um and so they're looking around trying to find what this noise is. And then off in the distance, close enough, and even in the dark, they're able to see basically like a huge, huge figure um, standing. And it's close enough that they're able to say, see that like this, this thing is huge. Okay. And, um, and he, they could tell, I think he said he could tell it like had hair or fur or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it, it was just sit, standing there on the beach like staring at him and um, making the, and the noise was coming from this thing. And as soon as they all saw it, you know, they were like, Oh, look, look, look. And uh, as soon as they all saw it, they all freaked out, just left their stuff there. A lot of their stuff there on the beach ran for the car, got in the car and just got the hell out of there. And uh, they basically (laughs) didn't go back. He said ever again to that location. Wow. And I was like, when my girlfriend told me this story, I was like, oh my God. And I don't, I've talked to this guy um, indirectly before. Like, mm-hmm. I, like I said, he's an acquaintance of mine, but he's not really a friend of mine. Okay. But it was just such an organic uh, experience of a story that he had shared out of nowhere, you know, like that just came out uh, in a conversation that I was like, that is crazy. Like, right. and um, I told her, you know, you, you should, you should encourage him to call in to, you know, what's this show, Sasquatch Chronicles, and share this experience because I'm sure he has more detail he didn't share. Yeah. That... And uh, uh, he's obviously, he's not going to, um, unfortunately. He's oh. actually, he's very like, he has a very, like, he's a, well, very, let's say he's a well off individual with a high position. Oh. So he's just like, doesn't want to get involved with that kind of stuff, I guess, uh, even despite maybe being anonymous. But um, I just had to call in and share it because it, it was a pretty crazy thing. When my girlfriend told me, I was like, wow, that, that's, that's pretty impressive. That is. And, it, and it's kind of that whole same idea that they weren't, they weren't looking for them. They were just doing their own thing, and, and yet one found them. And I think right. that that's the key. I, I don't think we're going to – we're not going to find them, but they will, they will uh, find us when they, when they want us. Yep. So very cool, yeah. man. Thanks for call, calling in and yeah. sharing that, brother. No problem at all. I just, I just thought it was fascinating. And, yeah. you know, I don't hear any other, you know, experiences similar to that, uh, exactly like that one. So I thought it was pretty unique. Very cool. Yeah, brother. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, call in any time, man. It's great to hear from you. Yeah. Awesome, man. Have uh, a good night, guys. All right. Good night, Android. Good night, Thank bud. you. Awesome. And awesome also for Eliza. Thank you so much. Wow. That's amazing. That's awesome. Wonderful. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's the key. You just don't go looking for them. You just try to become something they want to see. 
And that's probably the big takeaway. I think Bobo was always really good about that. Speaking of finding Bigfoot, he would, he would come up with these really weird plans, like the disco lights and stuff. And, and, uh, I, I think he's right. I think that that's, that's what you got to do. We're not going to sneak up on him at all. Nope. So that's amazing. Very Pretty good story. About that. No doubt about it. Sure. Um, all right. We're going to dive back into this article a little more here. Certainly. Certainly. All right. Um, there we go. There's the button with the big eye. <laughs> that's already creepy. Uh, number three, Treasure Island. I wonder if this is the one that, that we read. Okay. I guess we can read it again. If we hit a redundancy, we hit a redundancy. Nothing I can do. Um, Treasure Island is the name of this this one. And it's uh, actually the last one was CBWI had submitted that one. Or GBWI, rather. Treasure Island. This was around 2006 when I was 10 years old. It was after midnight. I was sleeping in one of my aunt's beds while my brother slept in another adjacent to mine. Across from us was our grandparents' bedroom, and downstairs next to the laundry room was my parents' bedroom. I woke up groggy, confused, and needing to pee really, really badly. I know how that feels. <laughs> and, and suddenly, I heard a voice. With eight people in the house, that really wasn't uncommon. Someone had probably gotten up to go to the washroom and either started talking to someone else or they had answered the phone. Mind you, I was still half asleep, so... To me, a phone call after midnight seemed total, totally reasonable. Well, it turns out that couldn't have been possible because I didn't recognize the voice. That was what immediately woke me up, and I froze, clutching my blanket while sitting up in bed. It was a man. His voice wasn't deep, not like my dad or grandfather's, and he kept prattling on about some treasure. He was right outside the door, but he never turned the doorknob or made any attempt at entering any of the rooms. He just kept passing by as if pacing, all the while talking to himself about his treasure. Mm -hmm. I, I was terrified and, and looked over to my aunt, who was sound asleep. Uh, I still don't know how, but I managed to not wet the bed. Eventually, the voice went silent, and I somehow fell back asleep. Wow, that's a hell of a bladder. <laughs> The next morning, everyone is doing their thing, getting ready for work or school, or busy in the kitchen, so I assumed it was all just a dream. I really wish I'd kept my mouth shut. As I'm eating breakfast, I told my mom and grandmother about the voice and laughed at how weird the brain is. Well, they froze. Everyone froze. It turns out the voice was real. I hadn't, meant, uh, I hadn't mentioned his obsession with the treasure, but my grandfather did. And as did my mom and brother, and everyone agreed about the treasure thing. Apparently, he combed the entire house, but never actually entered any of the rooms. Nothing was taken. All the doors were locked, and all the windows had screens, none of which were missing. And two weeks later, while I was helping my grandparents clean out the garage, my grandmother found several empty Coke cans behind the sofa, which had been up against one of the walls for quite some time. There were, there were also empty bags of chips, candy wrappers, fruit cores, and peels, all of which were taken from the garage. The sofa was high enough for someone to lay underneath, so the guy had clearly been inside our house, inside our garage. We've moved now, as, uh, as have my aunts, but my grandparents still live there, and we're only about a three-minute drive from them. We still don't know who he was, how he got in, and most importantly, how long he'd been inside of our home. Wow. Yes. You ever see that video? It was like some guy, I, I think it was some guy in an apartment was like noticing <laughs> noticing his leftovers were disappearing and stuff. So he put up a, a like a, a, a security camera in his yep. kitchen. Yep. And then he's watching it and some woman like removes a ceiling panel, crawls down, goes into the fridge and grabs stuff and then climbs back up and then pulls the ceiling panel back in place. And apparently this woman was homeless and she was living in the base, basically the crawl space uh, up in the attic or whatever and <laughs> would come down every night and uh, use the use the restroom and all that stuff and uh, would help herself to, to food items. in the fridge. <laughs> yeah, and uh, this went on for quite a while, but he did, once he once he saw that video, he called the police and they, they were able to get her out and all of that. But man, how's that for creepy? I mean, you have no idea what that person's all yeah, about or how broken that person is. It's yeah, like, could be, yeah. yeah, when's this go sideways? Hey, uh, speaking of weird people, 
<laughs> okay. Somebody in the chat, and I'll get to who it is in a second, but it says, sometimes I wonder if the voice in my head is actually me or someone else. Like there's two of me doing different things. That was from Naysay. <laughs> of course it was. Now, of course, right below that, so you've got Cannabis Res, which is Naysay, mm -hmm. and then right below that is the Megaphone Man. It says the exact same thing Ooh, because creepy. it's the exact same person. Yeah, <laughs> same person. So I wonder, is it two different people, Naysay? Is it Cannabis Res <laughs> and Megaphone Man? Absolutely. All up in there. <laughs> Actually, uh, the BC Boys have a song on their uh, Five Burrows album called The Crawl Space. Oh, do they really? And it's called, it talks about I'm in your crawl space. Oh, so like, oh no, no. Well, speaking of crawl spaces, we have just a little seconds away from the, the last break. So Crawling we're going to, towards the last we're gonna, half hour. That's it. We're going to go to the last break, folks. So don't go away. We'll be back with the last remainder of the paranormal portal. So don't go away. That's, uh, there will be attendance on the other side. Just saying. Could be a quiz. You never know. Yeah, well, yeah, whatever.
done. Huh? You know what time it is? Uh, duh. I know what next Sunday is. It's, it's time for the last part of our show. Last part of the show? <laughs> well, time is yeah. short. What, what's with the next Sunday here? Uh, what? Don't forget to set your clocks. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah This yeah, Sunday yeah. or next Sunday? I, I think it's, it's next this, Sunday. this one. This right? Sunday? I don't know. That sucks, because I'm going to lose an hour of sleep. <laughs> I don't sleep, so I guess I'm not really losing anything. That's right. You got to sleep in order to miss that, don't you? Yeah. You're you're, you're kind Trust of. Trust me, I miss sleep. <laughs> you had a creature of the night, aren't you? No, I just lay in bed going, God, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, we are in the last segment of the show tonight. As always, we're absolutely thrilled to have you with us as we dive through the last segment of the Paranormal Portal. And remember, we do a show tomorrow night as well. And uh, you can find that as well at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on TFR Live as well as right here on YouTube. So however you choose to listen to the portal or, or to be a part of the portal, you can do that tomorrow night too. And uh, stay tuned because on Sunday we release the new podcast. And the next, the next podcast is going to be an epic one as well. The last one that's live now is an uh, interview we did with, uh, with Lyle Blackburn. Lyle Blackburn. Yep. We talked to Lyle and had a good talk with him. And, and uh, he, of course, is a, a TV personality and cryptozoologist and author, musician, and uh, allegedly makes a hell of a hot sauce. <laughs> so we talked to him about all those things. And uh, this Sunday, who, who, who's, on, who's on this Sunday? Um, some guy that makes movies. Yeah, some movie guy. Yeah, Bray Road Beast or some yeah. silly stuff. Bray Road Beast and mm, and uh, lots like of other some, some cryptozoological Mothman. Moth yeah, some guy. Uh, is, somebody I'd never heard of before. Bread, bread love, <laughs> bread, bread, breed. Seth Breedlove is Breedlove be Seth Breedlove that's yep. his name. Yep, he's yeah, going to be joining like us. Short timer monsters or something. Like small town monsters. Small town monsters. Yes, that's, that's right. Him. We're really excited right. to let that episode roll. Yep, we're going to release that on Sunday, so we'll keep watch for that as well. I had a great talk with him. Seth's a lot of fun to talk to. He's a uh, and he's a compelling guy. Very interesting, and uh, we had a great talk about his research and about his journey, of course, and. Uh, just uh, about small town monsters and the uh, the umbrella of work that that's continuing to evolve into. It's not just documentaries anymore. He's also got a couple of podcasts that are being done under that umbrella and uh, several other things. So, Eliza, I cook really well. Yeah. Yeah. She said she wants to uh, hire a housekeeper or a wife. <laughs> I cook well. Yeah, but you're not much for the wife part. No, yeah, that's true. But nah. that's not the point. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> the, the way is through the heart, right? It's through the <laughs> stomach saying. or through the rib cage, whichever. That's <laughs> <laughs> however the knife slides in. That's right. <laughs> um, to the third rib. You know. Yep. Small, con small Town Monsters yep. guy is, uh, is the next podcast yep. episode. That's him. Seth Breedlove. Seth yep. Breedlove yep. So watch for that episode on Sunday. To be released Sunday, and if you're not Sunday, familiar with Sunday. if you're not familiar with the podcast, this <laughs> isn't it. This isn't it. This is our YouTube channel. This is entirely a different thing. The podcast is audio only, but you can check them out on all the podcasting platforms: Pandora, Spotify, iHeart, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Castbox, and uh, wherever you find your podcast. That's where you find us. In fact, wherever you might listen to Sasquatch Chronicles, just do a search. Other than Wes's app, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're not we're not it's, highlighted on Wes's app, but we're on his app as a, sometimes as been like you know, but you know we've been on his show a time or two. But yeah, you can find it on all the major platforms where where Sasquatch Chronicles is, or the Confessionals, or any number of other podcasts. So just look for us; we'll find you there too. There you go. Um, we're gonna get into a, an article that yes, I wanted Natalie, to cover. Spotify. Yeah, Sp yeah, definitely Spotify. We are on Spotify, Natalie, for sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's turning into a bigger and bigger platform for us on Spotify. So you can find us there. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, this article. This ah, article that sorry. I wanted to get into with the last segment of the show. And this is an article written by our good friend, Mr. Brent Swanser, who is a writer for MysteriousUniverse.org. He's just a fascinating guy. does a hell of a job on his work, and, and his research is impeccable. And uh, his work is featured on MysteriousUniverse.org. But if you want a chance to get to know Brent and get involved in his community on Facebook, you can find him on Dark League Paranormal. Dark League Paranormal on Facebook is his group. And fascinating guy, fantastic. And uh, 
he, he, he and Lon both contribute articles to our par- uh, Paranormal Portal fans page as well. So you can see I'm so, their work. I'm surprised he hasn't written anything about Kitsune. Kitsune? The, 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 the Devil Rock. The Devil Rock. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I haven't seen anything yet. Not sure yet, but he's probably... That'd be it'd be interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll try to catch up with him in chat and see if he's yeah, got anything working on that because that that's got to be a pretty big news over there. So Chopper says I listen to you, Tony, and Wes. Well, you've got good taste. Well, I don't know. You started out correctly, you, which is us. <laughs> Don. But you know, Don, Don, you just kind of went downhill from there. A little territorial, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. you guys know we love Tony and Wes. We do love Tony we and Wes. They've been the boys. they've been great friends to us and and uh, mentors and and uh, very cool. So, thank you for listening to us, though. We appreciate that chopper. Um, a harrowing series of UFO incidents during the Vietnam War mm-hmm. is what we're going to get into, and that's uh, Brent Swanser's article from. February 26, 2022. Also check out Mysterious Universe. It's a phenomenal site full of amazing articles by Brent Swanser and several other uh, amazing writers as well. So let's get into this article. In every war, there are often lesser-known experiences floating about beyond the typical tales of fighting and heroism. Here in the, here in the background of all of the conflict and death often lurk outlandish accounts of something strange going on. Yeah. Something perhaps even more frightening than the enemy. Actually, when Wes was on the podcast, he shared a story apparently from uh, some colonel in the Special Forces who talked about his time over in Nam and some giants. Mm-hmm. And if you want to hear that episode, folks, look for the Paranormal Portal podcast. And it was the Chronicles of Sasquatch is the name of that episode that uh, Wes joined me on and, and talked about it. It was absolutely amazing. Um, anyway, the Vietnam War, also known as the Second Indochina War, fought between, uh, between the years of 1955 and 1975, officially between North Vietnam and South Vietnam. But as most of you know, America pulled into it starting from 1964. Also has such otherworldly tales. Uh, one aspect of the Vietnam War that has long slipped under the radar of the mainstream consciousness is that amongst the fighting and violence, the conflict was absolutely rife with reports of strange things in the sky that defied conventional explanation. Reading like something out of the science fiction story or alien invasion flick, these frightening accounts of encounters with UFOs during the Vietnam War suggested that it was not only the North Vietnamese forces that were the spookiest things out there, but also decidedly more otherworldly forces as well. By all accounts, it seemed that troops in the Vietnam War were absolutely plagued by UFO activity, and some of the most spectacular reports of alien encounters during the Vietnam War have to do with actual military engagements with UFOs. One such incident allegedly occurred on June 15th, 1968, along the demilitarized zone, DMZ, between North and South Vietnam, where a patrol boat known as a PCF-12, commanded by Lieutenant Pete Snyder, was on a routine night patrol near Kua Viet. And at 12.30 a.m., PCF-12 reportedly received a frantic distress call from another patrol boat in the vicinity, PCF-19, claiming that they were being attacked by unidentified lights and that they were calling enemy helicopters, which seemed odd because the North Vietnamese enemy were not known to utilize combat helicopters at the time. Snyder ordered the PCF-12 to head for PCF-19's position to offer assistance, and as they, as they closed in, reported spotting in the sky two circular bright lights immersed in a strange glow hovering over PCF-19's position. As they approached, one of the strange lights reportedly admitted a bright flash of light after which PCF-19 exploded in a cascade of water and flying debris. Directly after the destruction of PCF-19, the two enigmatic lights were described as rapidly accelerating away towards the sea as PCF-12 scouted the area for any possible survivors uh, of the carnage they had just witnessed. Two wounded men were found and recalled that the two UFOs had been trailing them for miles along the river. The survivors then claimed that they had decided to fire upon the threatening mysterious objects, and that was when one of them had issued a piercing blast of light to obliterate the boat. At first it was thought by officials that PCF-12 had been the victim of an enemy missile fired from shore, but a later AP dispatch from Saigon 
would quote a military spokesman as having attributed the loss of PCF-19 to an unidentified object Mm -hmm. and not enemy coastal batteries Mm -hmm. or missiles. The PCF-12 continued his patrol up the river and were soon approached by the same two unidentified lights which took up positions hovering on the port and starboard sides around 300 yards away and 100 feet above the water. PCF-12 called in to headquarters to try to get an idea of what they were dealing with, but they were met with the response that there were no aircraft in the area at the time. Realizing that these craft were not friendly, Snyder ordered his men to open fire. Well, that didn't work well before, but let's try it again. Open fire uh, on the lights, which apparently did not little to phase or even slow them down, and PCF-12 began to retreat at full speed as the two mysterious aircraft tailed and stalked them. Flickering in the night the whole time, second engine man Jim Steffies would later claim that he got a good look at the craft and described them as having a rounded front like an observation helo, helo and what looked like two crewmen sitting side by side. Mm. Strangely, although no weapons could be seen mounted on the unidentified aircraft, PCF-12 nevertheless found itself being fired upon. Steffis remembered seeing tracer rounds piercing up into the night from the nearby base Point Dumi, uh, with their targets being what he said were other far-off blinking circular lights whizzing about in the sky above. Eventually, a group of Phantom F-4 fighter jets arrived to converge upon the chase and chase the strange lights that were plaguing PCF-12 out to sea, leaving the crew to, po- to wonder what in the hell had just happened. At roughly the same time, another very strange incident was unfolding out in the China Sea, South China Sea, with an allied ship of the Royal Australian Navy, the HMAS Hobart, which was patrolling near Tiger Island about 20 kilometers off Cap Lay and reported sighting up to 30 unidentified slow-moving lights hovering in the night sky near their ship, which were at first thought to be Russian-built M14 Hound helicopters, but upon closer inspection, it could be seen that they were not. U.S. 7th Air Force Phantom Fighter bombers were sent to engage, supported by a generous anti-aircraft fire from the ground. The lights flew out to sea as they were being pursued by the fighters, which fired upon them mercilessly, along with several other military ships in the area, which unfortunately contributed to the friendly fire incident in which a U.S. swift boat was sunk by missiles killing five of the seven crew. The HMAS Hobart was prepped for battle when the radar room detected an incoming identified aircraft, unidentified aircraft, coming in fast, with no identification number to mark it as friend or foe. Word soon came in that the craft was friendly, but it was then that a missile struck the ship to kill one and injure two others. Followed by a barrage of two more missiles, Whatever the craft was swiftly, uh, fl- swiftly fled the scene before it could be shot down. In the meantime, F-4 jets scrambled about firing upon the lights joined by a hail of anti-aircraft fire from the ground with attempts to communicate with whoever was on board the mystery craft. Yeah, you should do the communication part before you're lobbing well, anti-aircraft. you know, sometimes it's best <laughs> to ask, you know, ask for forgiveness than permission. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, with that, and the mystery craft going unanswered. Um, eventually the lights floated off and the fighter pilots who were ordered back to base the following morning, a complete search of the area turned up, not a single shred of wreckage of an enemy helicopter or any other enemy aircraft for that matter, despite the intense fighting that had occurred, the complete and utter lack of any wreckage of any aircraft was baffling considered, considering that these enemies had come under such resistance and had been met with so much concerted, relentless fire. The Royal Australian Navy news would later confirm no physical evidence of helicopters destroyed has been discovered in the area of activity, nor has extensive reconnaissance produced any evidence of enemy helicopter operations in or near the DMZ. Mm -hmm. There was little confidence among the men engaged in the incident that the aggressors had been enemy helicopters, as was first claimed. After all, if that were the case, they should have been decimated by the potent retaliatory force displayed upon their arrival and attacks. There was also no trace whatsoever of helicopters at the time in the area before or during the incident, 
and no wreckage afterwards. A skipper aboard the Hobart w- uh, during the baffling encounter would later claim that it was certainly not enemy helicopters expressing his doubt of such a theory by saying, Neither before nor after the incident was there any report by any of the ships of a helicopter being there around Tiger Island. And now having said that, the captain of one of the American ships told me later at Subic Bay that he thought there were helicopters there, but the fact is he didn't report. And if he believed there was a helicopter, it was his duty to report it at the time, but there was no report. Whatever the lights were that caused so much chaos continued to be sighted sporadically for months afterwards along the DMZ, furtively skirting around the area, wandering back and forth over the line and baffling those who saw them. They were often sighted by radar roaming up and down the coast, and apparently no one could quite figure out what they were. They appeared on radar to be low, slow-moving objects, just like helicopters, but often there would be no visible confirmation or they would not look at all like helicopters. They were also prone to just disappearing into thin air, and jets scrambled to intercept the objects would arrive to find nothing there. Troops on the ground would sometimes witness the lights appear and disappear out of nowhere, and in one such case, American artillerymen reported seeing a group of mysterious lights along the Ben High River. But when they opened fire on them, the objects had suddenly vanished as if they had never been there at all. At no point did anyone report seeing an actual helicopter, and the strange objects were always described as moving lights, often hovering erratically or moving in sudden bursts of speed inconsistent with a helicopter. The origin of the strange lights remained unknown to this day. There were theories at the time that somehow a misreading of radar signals had occurred, and which had made the other friendly vessels appear to be slow-moving flying blips, or that the North Vietnamese had more helicopter power than it had been previously assumed. In the end, the official explanation was that it was all due to atmospheric disturbances. Of course, Don, it was atmospheric disturbances. Of course it was. <laughs> That's what happens when you throw up you know, weather balloons and stuff. Yeah, they shouldn't have been flying those weather balloons all over that place. Uh, or possible enemy helicopter activity coupled with panicked friendly fire and there have also been theories that it was all due to bird flocks or even (laughs) insect swarms but does any of this really match up to what occurred would trained navy and fighter jet personnel go to engage such mundane phenomena what hit the hobart indeed what attacked the pcf 12 Mm -hmm. and 19 at precisely the same time if there were enemy helicopters involved there was uh where was all the wreckage and why were they never successfully shot down And wouldn't these trained men know helicopters when they would see them? It was also strange that an enemy helicopter would so brazenly venture over the heavily defended DMZ. And it would be strange that they should fly around with their lights on all all of the time for hours on end. In the case of the Hobart, it seems that obvious that this was some sort of concerted attack, but by who or what remains open to debate and speculation. It's interesting that these reports make mention of enemy helicopters, as this was a term used so often to to describe any unidentified lights in the sky in Vietnam that it became sort of a code word for UFO. Regardless of any relation to the object had to to uh, had to an actual helicopter, becoming sort of a catch-all phrase for anything weird in the sky. The fact that the Viet Cong were not known to use helicopters made a perfect way to explain discreetly when men were seeing something in the sky that shouldn't be there. On October 16, 1973, the U.S. Air Force Chief of Staff, General George S. Brown, gave a press conference in Illinois where he addressed this terminology to some extent when asked about UFOs in Vietnam, saying, I don't know whether the story has ever been told or not. They weren't called UFOs. They were called enemy helicopters. And they were only seen at night, and they were only seen in certain places. They were seen up around the DMZ, demilitarized zone, in the early summer of 68, and this resulted in quite a little battle. And in the course of this, an Australian destroyer took a hit, and we never found any enemy. We only found ourselves when this had all been sorted out, and this caused some shooting there, that was, there was, and there was no enemy at all involved, but we always reacted, always after dark. Another comment on the matter was made by a patrol boat captain by the name of excuse me, Bill Cooper, who served in Vietnam from 67 
to 69 during a UFO conference in Los Angeles in 1989. Cooper would say of his own experiences, After about five months, I was sent up to, to the north to the Z, DMZ to a place called K, K or Kua VF or something, or perhaps Kua Viet, on the Taycan River. And it was while there that I discovered that there was a tremendous amount of UFO alien activity in Vietnam. It was always reported in official messages as enemy helicopters. Now, any of you who know anything about the Vietnam War know that the North Vietnamese did not have any helicopters, especially after our first couple of air raids in North Vietnam during 1965. Even if they had, they would not have been so foolish as to bring them over the DMZ because it would have ensured their demise. Another American ship was not directly attacked, but nevertheless allegedly had a very intimidating and threatening encounter with an unidentified underwater submersible, or USO. In 1974, the ammunition ship, the USS Kileau, or Kilaway, uh, was operating in the Indian Ocean along with a destroyer and a carrier, and the witness claims that one evening at around 9 p.m., he'd been on deck with two friends looking up into the brilliant array of stars in the night sky. Their attention was drawn to the eerie beauty of the shifting light trails formed by phosphorus algae in the wake of the ship in formation in front of them. Yet as they watched this light display of nature, something else began to glow in the depths, becoming brighter and brighter, until it became a blinding orange-yellow ball just under the surface. The mysterious blazing orb then spectacularly burst forth from the water to arch right over the top of the destroyer, just missing, smashing into it, before crashing back into the ocean on the other side and sinking back into the dark depths. The witness would say of the puzzling and frightening incident, we all just stared at each other with our mouths open. We could not believe what we just saw, but we asked our friends, but I asked friends of mine who were on watch on the bridge if they saw it, and they all did. There was nothing ever reported that I know of, though, and we just quit talking about it. I bet the destroyer got a good look at it. It went right over the bridge of that ship, and it was big, maybe 150 to 200 feet in diameter. Wow. That was my big encounter. Uh, thank you, Gigi. Uh, it was all very intriguing peek into some of the more mysterious aspects of this conflict. Such tales lurk beyond the known history of the Vietnam War, hiding in the cracks and shadows and invisible, lost to the mists of time, save for a few who are willing to share their bizarre tales. Mm -hmm. What went on out there in the skies above all that fighting? What, what were these troopers dealing with? Were these cases some sort of experimental aircraft? the stresses of combat playing tricks on the imagination, or something altogether more bizarre. The true answers may have been buried in history and lost to the mists of time. Mm. Wow. Yeah, Great you article. know, there's, there's a, there was a million, I'm sure there's a million stories that have never been told oh, about yeah. the enemy helicopters. And I knew, I knew that that's what they were calling them. Did you? you know, okay. Yeah, because it just didn't make sense at the time. Yeah. But then again, you know, I've kind of dug into history about that kind of stuff anyhow. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I've always known that that's what they called them, you know. Sure. And, and never really, you couldn't find really any stories about them. But leave it to Brent Swanser to find obscure stories like this. Yeah, and, and uh, the level of research, even following up with the researchers exactly. at UFO conferences, the people living these things, talking at UFO conferences. Yeah, as soon as it said uh, enemy helicopters, I was like, I didn't think they had any. They didn't, yeah, they didn't have any, yeah. <laughs> they didn't have any. They were, they were all, you know, pretty much ground forces, but yep. what an incredible array of experiences. And it doesn't surprise me. I suppose if you're if you're watching mankind, if you're kind of sitting on the edge mm -hmm. of of the bench watching what's going on on the court, you're going to probably learn a lot watching the, you know, war as as ugly as that would be. You're going to learn a lot about us in a hurry. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's just, it stands to reason they would be watching. So, I don't know. There you go. There you go. But you know where else we're going? Where else are we going? We're going off the air pretty quick because oh, goodness. we're down to about the last minute, Don. Oh, no. Anything in closing? Um, Teesprings. Go Teespring. To, go, go to, to teespring.com, teespring. folks, to get Fire your own portal paranormal portal gear. And uh, Ruger, don't, don't, don't worry. We haven't forgotten about you. No, we have not forgotten. No. So, um, but uh, also take a look over there. It definitely goes a long way to help support us. Thank you to all of you who super chatted. Gigi, this is for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And everybody gets it. 
Um, <laughs> we appreciate it a bunch. Thank you to all of you who are able to help out in that way. That means a lot. But if you want to help us in other ways, just share the shows. Uh, po post these um, videos on your social media. Let people know about the portal. That's really going to help us in the long run because we're closing in on 10,000 subs. Yep. Is it a big number for YouTube? No. But is it a big number for us? Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us. We love you all. Be good, be kind, be nice. Take care of each other, help each other out, find the magic in every day, and remember to laugh as much as you can. Good night, everybody. Good night.